Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, super excited to be here. I came to the last Nordic Growth Hackers and it was just so awesome that I, I, I spoke to and I wanted to come and do this, so it was really fun. By coincidence, we, we raised the money, which is a good timing um, to have this talk now. And I just thought I'd do a quick show of hands. Who here actually uses Plio today um, in their day-to-day -day or for, okay, so a few people. Uh, who here wants to use Plio? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so what I thought I would do, and, and the, the agenda was more like tell a story about how we grew and, um, when I joined, and I'll, I'll explain on the next slide who I am and, and what I do now in Plio, but I wanted to share the story of how we did this from Copenhagen and actually not necessarily having an office in the UK and the, the leverage we use to make that happen. So I cut it up into three parts, which I thought might make most sense. The first one kind of sets the scene on perhaps how we were able to do this quite effectively. Then the middle piece kind of shows two things that we really did to kind of execute. And then I'm a big fan of giving like tangible things that you can take away for tomorrow and actually try and do yourself. So I'm gonna share like two growth hacks um, that really worked well for me, um, if those could be useful to share. Um, but also a lot of news for me. So yesterday, um, um, or Monday, my role changed. I'm now head of market launching at Plio, which is super exciting for me, leveraging what I did um, with the UK and with my colleague Mary Louise when we launched that market. And I thought I'd give a bit of context from people who don't know me. Uh, I am Danish by birth, and I'm also Dutch, but I'm also Caribbean. Um, the awkward part is that I have passports for Denmark and Holland, and I can't speak either language, which makes it very interesting when I come into Copenhagen uh, with my Danish passport. Um, and then I grew up in the Caribbean, but then I spent 10 years in the UK. Um, I went to high school there, then university. Um, and the weirdest part probably is that I have a master's degree in drug discovery. And I just put Breaking Bad there because basically what I used to do was design and make drugs. Um, and I don't know how I ended up in FinTech. Uh, I worked in six startups before, mostly in the UK, and then I worked in uh, Qwit here in uh, Copenhagen, and also I, I did some stuff with Deemly, and then I was the first hire for the UK. So when I spoke to Yepit, he was like, let's go for the UK. He had just re raised seed funding from um, uh, around in, in the UK, so we were like, let's go. And then we went about the hard lunch in August, and then it all went crazy. So. The story then is how did we get to this number? How did we get so many cool clients and, and how did that happen? And the biggest thing that I thought about, which I thought would be useful to set the scene for the story was um, the fact that these companies are across all industries, which is really random. Um, the useful part about Plio is that we're industry agnostic. We can work with any company because all companies have expenses and they feel that pain. And we actually, I pulled the data just to check this and it's true, so I just pulled the data from our, our system that we use in Plio, um, and if you look at the percentages, our clients are incredibly distributed across almost all industries, which is, which is weird, um, but it's really helped us from a, a positioning perspective because it's like an endless runway. We can work with it, almost anyone, and we don't have to niche anywhere specifically. But then what do we do? Uh, for those of you who don't know exactly what we do, so this tagline has evolved over time. Um, we used to just be about solving expenses, which we do really well and we get in. But now we've kind of evolved our space to be more about improving the way companies spend um, in future workspaces. And there's a lot of words around this and a lot of these words kind of connect to our values as a company. And what I'll get to in the, in the talk is how the values really helped in terms of how we actually got client advocacy because that was the main thing that helped us grow. And what I'll show you now, I think, is, is the product itself. And this is where most of the conditions prior to launching really helped us. Our product is really, really good and it solved such a huge pain that it really paved the way. It did probably 70% of the work and market conditions when we launched in the UK uh, two years ago, if you guys are familiar with things like Monzo, Revolut, Challenger Banks, even Lunar Way here in, in Denmark, the awareness of those kind of B2C services definitely helped because people were kind of aware of fintech. They didn't know what it was necessarily, but they were open-minded to it. And the product for sure completely drove the inbound. So for those of you who don't know, in the beginning days, we had an enormous inbound channel from Facebook. Facebook is our biggest inbound channel. We had like 70, 80% inbound leads, which is strange for a company when you're trying to scale. We were flooding in leads, which was nice so we could focus on quality and actually delivering an experience to those people. 
But then the pain was big. And, and this, you know, in all the companies that I work with, it's the pain that really dictates for me the success because a painful problem, people don't mind paying to solve. So everyone knew what the pain was. And going back to the industry agnostic, how we can work with anyone, our product also touches everyone in a company, employee, managers, and the finance team. So everyone could become an advocate for this because they gained value from it um, every day they used and touched it. And the pains were really big, um, and it, it really had a big impact. And then when they used the product, it then solved pain across all levels within the company. So for us, it wasn't necessarily selling to a person like a, a finance manager or a finance director. They, they're the ones that opened the door but once we got into a company, it was the employees that became the advocates. And they were the ones that helped referring us. They really aggressively would shout about us on Instagram and tell people about it. And then from reverse engineering, others would hear about it in other companies. They would tell it to their finance managers and it would go up funnel. And that was super interesting to see those viral loops begin to spread. Um, but the actual journey. So here's the story. So how did we do it? And a key theme that we run in Plio, which is ridiculous because it's super strong and I don't really know exactly where it comes from, but we give a great product, but it's the actual sort of um, expectation. So we give everyone way more than what they might expect. And that's things like, you know, customer service, like for us, you know, responding in less than five minutes is critical. Like, and giving that level of customer service is so fundamental to not only a good product, but they know they can actually talk to us. Um, it sounds really basic, but it's, it's phenomenal how important that is to our brand. And we have this thing that we made in Plio, which um, we kind of are very religious about in terms of how our product works. Everything on the left, obviously we can influence the product and our service. As you progress to the right, we call it the magic zone. These are things that are happening as a result of using the product or interacting with us. We are trying to slowly influence this over time. And that's where the future of work comes in. So we build trust in a company so we can change their culture themselves. We improve the transparency of that business just by using the product and speaking to the people that we work with. And then we help them distribute responsibility, become more efficient. And then everything we do in the entire life cycle when we were selling, it kind of funnels towards this intangible magic that we can't necessarily control, but we really heavily focus on and we influence. And when we get to the magic zone, it just explodes. Like people become enormous advocates. And starting things like our focus 100% was putting people and our, and our users at the center of everything we did specifically in the UK, but also in Denmark, for anyone who definitely uses it in, in Denmark. And this is just an example of, of what we did. So once we got into a company, and these are, it, we, I would fly to the, to the UK a lot, and I'll show that on the next slide, but we did these weird things, like we would take selfies with our customers because it was so random, but they loved it. And I don't remember how it started, but we just started doing it and then it became a thing. So whenever we would go visit customers, they would be like, where's our selfie? And then the, re the real reason we did this was for our developers. So people back in the Copenhagen office building the product, they can't see our customers. So the theory was, why don't we take pictures, create like a massive wall so they can see here's who you're fighting for. Here's what you're building this product for. And that was the theory, but it just came into something like this. And this was very powerful because they were really connected on the journey with us. And that's when they began, they began to fight for us. But everything from customer service to the sales cycle to even when a customer might even churn, the experience was so unanimous and consistent. And the cool thing is when you meet a customer of ours in the UK here or whatever, I can tell that they're a customer because I can just feel like, yeah, you've, you've kind of been through that Plio experience and they're just super happy people. Um, and I just, I pulled some random things that I saw when we announced the funding round. So, um, so many companies preach user centricity and our, our users and our customers, they preach this back to us. And that makes me think and feel that this is super true. Um, you know, like we're together in this journey, favorite client, and then people are always posting really fun, um, really nice things about us. And that reassures me that the experience is super, like 
unanimous and it's super powerful. And it's people like this that are constantly posting and posting back to us, which spread the word. And this guy, David, he's a fanatic, but he's, he's super cool and he just loves our product and he, he shouts about us in all of his content. And this builds over time um, and it goes into like an avalanche process where a lot of people start doing it and that's very powerful for how we grew in the UK. And these are our UK clients, except for um, Victoria over there. And that's why we have high NPS scores, because people can talk to us, it's super engaged, and they get a, a, that consistent experience. And then this is what I call the Stansted hustle. Um, this was just a funny slide I thought I would put in, but this by far was f fundamental in building that experience you saw in the previous slide. But what I want you to focus on is this piece. So maybe in August, Yep has said to me, Yep is our, our CEO, he said, Hacken, just start flying. Just go as much as you want. Just start doing this and getting that presence. So I was like, okay. So almost every two weeks, we would book flights in advance. So we would book every Wednesday in advance for almost a month. And when you did that, flights between Copenhagen and Stansted are 158 krona return. That's super cheap. And I don't care who you are, CAC, cost for acquisition of a customer. So we would book three, four week consecutive in a row. And then getting on a train to Liverpool would be 250 krona return, using the underground, lunch and dinner. So all together was 678 krona per trip. And that's super cheap. And what we would do is then we would compact as many client meetings as possible into that day, maybe six or seven. And we would focus on a region in, in London, for example, where we could get to all of them really quickly. Very powerful, and that really was a good growth hack for us. So anyone who wants to expand from Copenhagen specifically to London, highly recommend this strategy. It worked really well. But look at the time commitment, 4 a.m. to 12 a.m., 20 hour days, and we did that almost every two weeks. It's really heavy on the body, so you have to be super passionate and very committed. But if you really want to grow from like, you know, three customers to 100, and Jonas um, Gunnarsson did a talk last time on this, like flying a lot, this was magic, um, but a lot of commitment and, and a lot of focus because we'd have meetings the first day and the next day, but that was the view that we had almost every Wednesday, and uh, I think I, I went on 50 flights in one year, so it was a lot, um, but it, it really helped build those first advocates that really began to shout. Um, and then maybe to finish this off, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I did want to share like two specific growth hacks that I think have been super valuable um, that I'm hoping you guys might be able to take away and, and could implement even tomorrow. The first one is like, start something super unique with your customers. It sounds kind of dumb, but you know, doing selfies and, and doing this was so powerful for the network effect. I mean, when you look at these people, these guys over here, they're serious VCs. Like, you know, on a daily basis, they're like handling millions of dollars. But look how ridiculous they are. And they felt comfortable for me to take that picture because they knew that I wouldn't do anything stupid with it. But they were so connected to me as a person that, you know, Plia was a great product, but they loved the interaction. And we just did all kinds of random stuff, but we made it fun. And that's where the hat comes in. And everyone asks me, what's with this stupid hat that you wear? And I hate this hat, but it's, it's kind of cursed on me now. I can never take it off. Um, and here's what happened. I started wearing this hat randomly. I don't remember how it happened. And then I went to a meeting with a CEO and a CFO, and I kept the hat on. And they were like, who is this crazy young guy coming in here, like, like looking like Max Verstappen? What's he, what's he doing? Um, but because of that experience, I flipped the situation. So they were expecting some random, didn't know anything but I knew my stuff, I knew finance, I knew how to do month end, I knew all the things that they were not expecting. So that gave them that unexpected feeling and then it made a very powerful impression. So that's why it's kind of stuck and that's where the hat comes. And this middle picture, that's actually our biggest client now and that was a, mo that was a room full of all the top executives across the US, the UK, um, Australia and it was ridiculous but the, we had a good time. Um, so that's one thing, start a tradition. I don't know what it is, I do the pictures, but you know, do something, especially when you're trying to do like this kind of growth um, to get new people. And it, this is mostly with customers, but I tested it with pros, like people who weren't customers yet, it worked okay, but it was a bit weird sometimes. Um, the other one is, is something I'm working on. I'm actually writing an article on this, which I think is gonna be pretty powerful when I'm done. Use LinkedIn like Instagram. Sounds crazy, right? And be gentle on this one, but if you guys follow me on LinkedIn or if you don't, um, I post a lot. 
and I don't necessarily post about um, something specific, but it's more like keeping people involved in the journey of where we are, so people don't need a newsletter. Like, what's new at Plio? What's happening with, with coming up next week? So they can self-update and self-follow, almost like you would do flicking through Instagram to look at a cool picture, and that's where the important part is. So really good pictures, something interesting, good taglines, but you have to deliver value in the post. Some people are quite annoying on LinkedIn, which is fine, but you know, it has to deliver value because people on LinkedIn, in my opinion, they're looking for inspiration, something to learn from, and that's what they use it heavily for. And look at the view counts, and this is where it gets interesting. You know, not, it's not about vanity metrics, but this was the, the, the B round announcement. Yesterday, around 4 p.m., it was at 17,000 views. Today, it's at 41, so it's jumping, and it's at 600 views, uh, uh, likes. This was just uh, a few days ago. It's at 22,000 views, 13,000 views, 10,000 views. So the network effect really builds, and that's the reach. It's not about the likes, it's the reach, so you get awareness. And with this growth hack, in my opinion, um, I got a lot of people who would follow me. They just start following you. You get a lot of followers on LinkedIn. But then they would self-update, so you get a random message once we've connected, and they'd be like, you know, I was in a meeting with my CFO this morning, um, and he mentioned cards and expenses, and then I saw a post about yours this morning on the way to work, and I mentioned Plio, and he was like, oh, sounds interesting, I'll look into it. So it's a really cool network effect. But remember, it might be more unique to our product, but I thought it might be cool to share as something to, to kind of think about. Um, and this has been in incredibly powerful for me. Um, the reach on LinkedIn is enormous. I wish I could show you the graphs, but it's, it's not about the vanity metrics, it's really about the reach and a consistent message and being consistent in your process. But I would love, if anyone wants to know more before I leave today, happy to talk more about this and, and even show you the metrics because it, it's extremely powerful. So those are the two things. Take away, start something unique with your customers, I don't care what it is, but it's really powerful, and be consistent and almost use LinkedIn kind of like Instagram, but it takes time, you have to really be consistent with it. That's it for me, I, I think I'm on time, I hope. Um, that's my email, and for those who are not using Plio, I got a sign off from this from the marketing guys. Anyone who's interested, uh, if you email me, I think I can get you guys like a two month trial or something like that, but that's a soft sell. Um, but that was super cool, and I hope that was, that was interesting. Um, and the next, the next six to eight months are gonna be crazy, uh, and I'm focusing on Sweden and Germany, and then we're gonna be launching probably three new markets in like six to eight months. Um, and it's just a roller coaster, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, thanks.